Before we get started with this week's episode, I just want to say that our hearts go out to everyone who is suffering in Turkey and in Syria. As of today, the death toll has risen to over 17,000 individuals, and it's just an absolute travesty over there from the, uh, the two major earthquakes and the hundreds of aftershocks. I hope uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see that the world has come together to really help these people in their time of need, and I hope that you will find some way um, either to keep them in your thoughts and prayers or to donate to the many funds that are helping people over there uh, to do your part. Back to the show. This week, in, in honor of the Super Bowl and my personal team, the Philadelphia Eagles, Go Birds, being in the Super Bowl, we are going to make hoagies, upon which you could put any number of things, but specifically and more likely cheesesteaks. So we are going to be making our recipe with instant yeast. It is a little bit of a different process because we don't bloom the yeast. We've worked with instant yeast on the show before, but we've never made hoagie rolls. So I'm very excited to do this, and I'm very excited to see our birds win the Super Bowl. Um, one quick note before we move forward, there will be no show next week in observation of President's Day in the United States. All right, that being said, let's get started. All right, everyone. First up, we are going to put two cups of our bread flour into our standing mixer. Next up, we are going to take our yeast. That is one package of yeast or two and a quarter teaspoons. After that, we're going to add our two tablespoons of sugar, and then we are going to add one and a quarter cups of our water. We are going to set this aside to beat for about four minutes. You want to make sure that this is thoroughly combined. It's entirely possible that you need to scrape down the sides of the bowl as you are doing this. Don't be afraid to do that or stop the motor, you are not going to hurt the bread dough by doing this. So after four minutes, it will be ready for the remainder of the flour and the salt. So we're going to add about a teaspoon of salt, but you know I like to estimate, so add as much as little as you like. And then we're going to add our, the remaining flour about a cup and a half, one cup at a time. Now I did not need nearly as much flour as it called for in this recipe. So I'm just warning you, because the dough consistency you're looking for is actually pretty wet, it's called slack dough, which is to say a dough that doesn't hold its shape and seems and is very smooth and sheeny, you don't necessarily need a ton of flour because you're really not trying to dry this dough out. So add it a little bit of time. You can see I'm adding it about a quarter cup at a time, really trying to just get the most mixing done in the bowl before we actually combine everything. After that, you're going to knead for about five to six minutes and make sure that everything is as smooth as possible. After that, you're going to take your butter, four tablespoons which of which you've cubed, and set it set your standing mixer to medium speed or, or knead it in. In. You're going to add one tablespoon at a time until it's completely combined. Again, don't be afraid to scrape down the bowl. Do not add the next tablespoon of butter until the first tablespoon is fully combined. Next up, once it is done, it's going to be this lovely glossy dough. Just get that off of your standing mixer and put put that in a bowl. Uh, I highly suggest rounding, making it into a little ball before you set it to proof in a warm place for about an hour. All right, we have... Uh made and laminated our dough. We have gotten it to the slack texture that we need it to be, and we have put it somewhere to warm. I've set a timer for an hour, but that timer is uh, a little depleted already. Doing some cooking around the kitchen. We are going to chat some politics. If we're staying with us for the politics portion, great. Get back to that in a second. If you are not sticking with us, set a timer for an hour. Make sure to check though because you only really want this to be double in size and not more. I purposely set my warming drawer to low to make sure that we don't get too much rise. Overproofing these will cause them to lose their shape and then they won't get a nice uh, consistency and texture and shape that we're looking for. So if you are not staying, set your timer and I will see you in a moment. All right, so the first story I want to talk about is a follow-up to our uh, to our follow-up to our discussion about the OGL fight with Dungeons and Dragons. Now, there was an amazing development, and the players have won. Wizards of the Coast said that the um, original gaming license, or OGL 1.0a, will stay in effect and become irrevocable, and the entirety of the fifth edition rule set will become um, out in will go out into Creative Commons. So, in other words it will be accessible for anyone to use that kind of license forever, which is a really great move. So now that we've had this fight, it's really important to take a step back and think about lessons learned here and 
something like this were to come up in the future, right? If there's another, um, if there's another incident where they try and monetize D and D in a way that's not, you know, uh, that that hurts cre uh, that hurts creators or hurts just regular fans of the game, what 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 lessons do we learn here, right? First of all, being organized is extremely useful. One of the things that was really important about the OGL fight is the fact that the creators in their communities and players among themselves were all talking about this, right? And so, although there wasn't a single leader, there were set, there were in the, in essence lots of little movements that were doing really important things, like canceling their D and D or Beyond subscription, um, writing to uh, Wizards of the Coast and telling them how they felt, um, and of course many of the creators, as I mentioned last time, uh, found to oppose them in a legal lawsuit. Now, this was partly for financial reasons, right, as opposed to a pure organizing tactic, because it's very expensive to sue a large company like Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast. And many of these creators, although they make good money, aren't necessarily making let's field a team of lawyers type of money, especially for a long drawn out fight that a corporation is almost always going to win. So being organized is super important. And actually, it does seem that, our, that the creators, at least, have learned this lesson quite well because it was announced by some of the creators that there is, um, they don't call it a union, but it's effectively a union. It's a coalition of creators that have come together for the sole purpose of helping each other if something like this were to go awry. And by the way, this is extremely helpful. Even if we never have a situation like this ever again, if d and if Wizards of the Coast does something that is, you know, against their interests, at least that and they're all better and they can fight as one organized group as opposed to trying to fight it out like we did this time, which was kind of in many different groups. Now, mind you, we were successful this time, right? So it's it's important um, to be organized. To, it's important um, that they were able to do the work, right? And it's important that people did do the work, but that work is always easier to do and it's coordinated when it's organized. A lesson that we learned is that we should not take any of the any of what we have in terms of RPG gaming for granted. There will always be someone somewhere in a capitalist system that says there is going to be, there is not enough profit coming in from this, or we can give our shareholders more money, or the players don't matter. And actually, it sounded like from the leaks coming out of where do they think the players don't matter? Not only is it important for the creators to be organized, it's also for the players to be organized, right? And to not take these things for granted, to be watching and to be careful about how they. Um, how they interact with these companies, right? There are things that we as individuals can do to send a message to these large corporations, uh, some of which are going to be voting with our dollars, right? Not purchasing um, new books, not purchasing official content, uh, getting rid of d and Beyond subscriptions, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I would say to the players of the TTP, TTRPG community, you know, if you're using d and Beyond, that's great, but maybe also have access to a copy of the rules that isn't reliant on you having to pay for them. Or maybe keep your character sheet somewhere else, say like on paper or on Google Drive um, or, or some other platform that isn't specifically reliant on Wizards of the Coast and paying them money, right? So that just in case you do have to um, vote with dollars it, with something like that, or you have to not purchase a new book, you have some way to continue to do the pastime that you and I all love without actually having to, um, you know, disrupt your game, right? So you can send a message, but also not disrupt your game, right? But also, you know, there was a lot, there was a bunch of people who had some apathy about this. And then what I would say is, sure, it might not matter specifically to you, but one of the things that makes games like D&D &D and other TTP, TTRPGs um, fun is that there's like a whole universe of creativity out there and there are always people constantly innovating and so if we get rid of that community with some other move right and i talked about last time that one of the worst things that the creators could do is to all leave because truthfully not only does it hurt the game but it actually would, would have given hasbro and, and wizard exactly what they wanted and so you know we need to come together and support the, the community of creators and to, you know, not take any of this for granted. You know, these, in my opinion, are kind of the two major lessons that we we need to learn. I actually think the organization 
one is is well learned, right? We and sorry, the third lesson being apathy, right? We can't be apathetic um, towards these communities because they only exist because we assist them, right? So, so these three lessons I think are, are are really important for us to take forward in this fight. Again, I want to congratulate all the players. I think this is an amazing victory. Um, I think Wizards really screwed up with how they handled this, and I think they recognized that. And it's really exciting as a player myself and a, and a dungeon master myself to be able to go out into the world and enjoy this game without having to think about, you know, where can I get content or, you know, am I using official content and things like that. So, again, congratulations to all the players, to all the creators who won. Um, it was a really great effort and a lot of people did a lot of good work. So I want to thank everyone individually who did great things, um, whether it was threatening to sue or looking or doing the research on some items or canceling D&D Beyond descriptions. We all made this happen and we deserve to take credit for it. So good job, guys. We, we got one. You may have heard about this super scary Chinese weather slash spy balloon that was flying over the United States and it was taking pictures of military bases all around the country. Guys, let's pretend for a moment that it's not what the Chinese say it is, it's an actual spy balloon. It would be the most obvious and it would be the most stupidly obvious spying that the Chinese could possibly do on us, okay? The Chinese, and not just the Chinese, right? Every government has way more sophisticated ways of spying than that. In fact, the, a balloon is a spit that probably wouldn't use it at all. And that kind of gets to the root of this whole conversation and why it's so silly. Like people like lost their, their goofy minds about this stupid balloon. And it's like, hey, I hate to break it to you guys. We, you know, we signed permanent normal trade relations with China. We gave them loads of our IP, uh, it's our intellectual property. We have Chinese applications and cell phones and, and government run programs that we use in the US you know, that, that the Chinese government has access to. People use Alibaba, um, which is a Chinese store. They give them their data willfully. Guys, if the Chinese government wanted information on the US, there was a million better ways they could have done it than flying a stupid balloon over. Not to mention, by the way, and this isn't just something that happens with the Chinese, so I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna like make them out to be some particular villain. We spy on all of our allies and all of our enemies. In, during the Trump administration, if you remember, he was bragging about having secret information on President Emmanuel Macron of France. Um, farther back than that, there, I believe during the Obama administration, there was a leak of classified information that implicated Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany at the time. So the point is, we, we the United States, and, and our allies, and every other country, everybody's spying on everybody, okay? So try, try and keep... The, the kind of weather balloon story kind of in that context, right? That we're not, you know, we're not suddenly, the US, us, is not suddenly the victim of like some great super complex spy attack. The Chinese probably know all sorts of stuff about us. And it's not just the Chinese, right? I'm sure the Japanese know. I'm sure that our, our UK allies know, the French, the Germans, whoever else, right? I am sure that there are spies from all sorts of country all over the place. And so they're gathering information and we're gathering information on them. And, and you know, with any luck, we won't have to use it. But that, that information, it's, it's flying all over the place, guys. Right? You've seen some spy movies, right? People go in, they're dressed as regular people. You have no idea who they are. And they're just, they're listening in. They're catching conversations when they can. They're doing all sorts of stuff. To be spies, that's what spies do. They collect intelligence about sensitive things. You don't have to send something super obvious being like, hey, I am a giant spy balloon. Please fire a missile at me. And so then the other thing that brings me to is like shooting it down, like all you're going to do is, is annoy the Chinese now, which we ended up doing. And look, they're annoyed. I think they're hemming and hawing for no reason. I mean, ultimately, I think this whole conversation is really silly because if it, let's go back, let's get the benefit of the doubt, say it was a weather balloon. Okay, so we shot down a weather balloon. Dude, there are weather satellites all over the world. Did you really need that one particular weather balloon? And by the way, even if you did need that one weather balloon, it was probably broadcasting the information it was getting via radio waves or up to a satellite or over to someone on the ground somewhere in China the entire time. 
So you just cut short its mission, whatever its mission was going to be. The, the, the point is, guys, the point is, when you see a story like this that grabs these huge major headlines and people are freaking out and they're like, oh, we have to have like a hearing on it or whatever. And we have to shoot it out of the sky and it's a big threat. It's just the news media. We, we grab onto things that are, that are flashy and that, 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 you know, that are going to grab eyeballs because that's what media is. It's about eyeballs, right? It's about how can we get people to watch our content? And so, you know, this was kind of a very visible thing and like people made memes about it and it was a whole, like it became a whole thing that it didn't need to become. It could have gone the whole time it was over the US with no one caring. But we made it into a big thing because it was going to, you know, it, it took a nation state that we already kind of have on our official state enemies list. Um, it, it took something that people are already afraid about, which is, which is spying by, by a quote unquote hostile power. And it just combined these things to create fear and panic and, and eyeballs, right? Like no one's lives improved, no one's lives got worse. Well, maybe the operator of the balloon, but like you get the point. The whole thing is kind of silly. And I really wish that, that news media in general would do a better job of saying, hey, this is a nothing burger. There's more important stuff to be to be paying attention to in the world of our media. So that's that's my take on it. I, I really hope that you know when you go back into the world and you're thinking about kind of stories like this that are kind of the big eyeball catching, just try try and think a little deeper, right, about the story. Does this matter? Right. And that's that's really what media should be. It should be about the stuff that matters. So when you're ingesting media, when you're seeing these big eye-catching headlines, just just take a think. Does this matter? It might not. All right. So we have a labor story to talk about, and it labor story is of particular importance to me because it's in my backyard. So Temple University is a uh, a large public-private partnership university in northern Philadelphia, and its graduate students walked off the job about a week ago. I think it's nine days now that they have been on strike. And so they are demanding better pay, better hours, um, better benefits, and just, you know, because they make an incredibly small amount of money. So most graduate students um, make less than $20,000 a year, and they're expected to lead classes, grade homework, lead research labs, um, and do all this work. Now, in theory, they're really not supposed to be working more than 20 hours a week, but in reality, they actually work far more than that. And, uh, and they, they count as employees, but Temple, and by the way, this isn't just Temple, right? Other schools have done this in the past. They really try and um, make, uh, try and squeeze every last bit of work that they can possibly get out of these graduate students. Now, you may recall that the graduate students in California recently had a very large strike about very similar things. So this is along the same basic veins. And so Temple is now getting desperate to break this strike. And so one of the reasons they're getting desperate to break this strike is because fairly recently, and I don't remember the exact date, but they lost a union fight to the Temple Nurses Union. And so now things are actually looking really good for Temple Nurses and they got what they need and they have better um, uh, staff to patient ratios and they have better pay and better benefits and all that good stuff, right? So Temple's kind of reeling from that. And most in, perhaps more importantly to Temple at this point, the professors all have their um, collective bargaining agreement coming up in the next few months. And so this, this union fight is gonna be a bellwether for what they can get, right? Now, unfortunately, the professor's union is not able contractually to join um, the strike because um, you know, their, their union representative has told them this is kind of, I mean, we, you can support them, but you just can't strike. So they have been supportive, um, they, they are helping out, um, with, you know, anything they can. I, I know some of the, the Temple professors who are, who are trying to do good work um, here and who've been, who've been helpful to students in the past, but the students are really hurting, guys. And so, and, and so other unions have expressed support. So the, the Teamsters Union has stopped making deliveries at Temple, which by the way, is an excellent way to show solidarity. Um, I remember when the Teamsters were helping out at the strike in front of Hahnemann Hospital uh, in Philadelphia, and they, they shut down the main road. Um, to show solidarity with the with the strikers there, with the union there, so it's there's a there's a, a real big show of support. But Temple, as I said, has gotten desperate, and so in their desperation, been cutting the health 
benefits to these students, and they've been requiring them to pay tuition. Now, keep in mind, guys, that the, the majority of graduate students also take courses while they're um, while they're you know doing their graduate work, um, whether that's TAing students, leading research labs, etc. Right, and so that tuition is typically not collected from them. So as as a benefit, as a perk for them, because they are um, because they're working for the university, the university either collects a very small or no tuition from them for um, as a kind of a thank you for teaching some of the classes, right? Because as a graduate student, you still need credits to graduate and so on and so forth, and that's where the tuition courses come in. But Apple is now requiring them to pay full tuition in the next few weeks and has revoked their health and has revoked the health insurance of some groups of students. Now it's not, it's not clear how many students have been affected by the withdrawal in healthcare, um, but this is a sensibly cruel act that has been used by the likes of Amazon to crush um, to, to, to crush union efforts, whether it's organizing or striking. Um, and truthfully, it's it's a really disgusting tactic. And it, and by the way, I think that these types of actions by the employer by the boss are an excellent reason to have something like Medicare for all, where your employer cannot use your health care, your health insurance as a cudgel against you when you are fighting them for, you know, for pay and better hours and things like that. So it's it, it's really unfortunate, but there is a way that you can help. So uh, the, 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 Temple, the, the Temple Grad Student Union um, called Tugza, they have a website, and more importantly, they have a strike fund. So I will be leaving in the description of this video the link to the strike fund Please like and share this video as much as you can. Donate to the strike fund if it, you are able to do so. If not, just sharing that link. You don't even have to share this video. Share Just share that link around. Make sure that the people in your life who support Temple, who support Temple students, um, are able to have that link and to donate if they're able, or if not, spread the word, guys. It's really important that the students win this one. It's, it's important for the students themselves, right, to, to get their benefits back, um, to have better working conditions. Um, and to to show Temple that they can't um, manipulate these young adults into terrible working practices. And it's also important, not just for them, but it's also important for the professors' union fight that's coming up in the next few months to show Temple that uh, the unions are not going to back down and they're not going to lose against this uh, bullying behavior. So the the I'll, I'm going to tell you what the link is now. We'll have it in the description below. It's tugza.net slash strike. Tugza dot t u g s a dot net slash strike. All right, that is the location of their strike fund. You can donate to it there. These students need help. They don't have any other incomes that they can rely on, and they are fighting the good fight. So help fellow, you know, help fellow laborers, help fellow workers. Um, donate if you can, and if not, just share the link. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And stay and stay strong. Stay union strong. So last week. I was talking about the um, the bringing of tanks to to Ukraine and and how that's going to escalate the war there. And this, I wanted to take an opportunity to talk about a concept in war that we really haven't addressed on the show before, but um, is you know is a concept that it's it's worth knowing about um, in terms of how wars are fought and how wars are mobilized. Um, and it, it's it's helpful to just kind of contextualize where this is taking place. So what I'm talking about is called total war. And so total war is where a country completely reorganizes its economy um, and its ability to do basic functions for the sole purpose of fighting a war. And so we see the start of total war as a concept um, with the United States in the early 1940s. So after the US was bombed at Pearl Harbor, um, there was a massive transformation of the economy into a wartime economy, and and this involved this involved rationing certain goods, halting the production of certain consumer goods, and then making sure that you know, and, and so and, and making sure that all that effort was being put towards the war effort. So some examples of this were like you know. Um, instead of using brass for, say, musical instruments, you would move that brass to an to an arms factory and, and make bullets. Or, you know, a, a factory that was making clothes, uh, consumer clothes, designer clothes, um, would be asked to participate in the war effort by, <coughs> excuse me, um, by making military uniforms, right? 
Um, and you can say the thing with, with, food, with food packaging, on and on it goes, right? And so the whole country, not just the government, right, but the regular individual citizens, and oftentimes this is achieved through rationing or through, um, uh, through, through coupons that the government will hand out, ration coupons, um, to make sure that as much of the economy can possibly go towards the war front is, is actually going there. And so the reason I wanted to bring this up in terms of Ukraine is because one of the things that's kind of interesting about the war in Ukraine is that we've, we've kind of, we, we've seen total war, but also not really. So it's kind of in a weird hybrid of, of what total war typically is. Now, what's, what I think is actually very interesting is that although Ukraine has not fully shifted its economy towards kind of a war footing, the Russian economy has pretty much done that. And so, you know, it's not as intense as it was like in the United States in, in the 40s, right? You don't see like um, whatever the Russian of gap is, and I'm just picking on them as one company, right? But like, you know, making military uniforms in, instead of making um, in, instead of making kind of their typical consumer clothing, but you do see that the the mobilization is massive, and they're they're you know they've returned to the draft, and to the extent possible, they are moving as as many resources as possible towards the war effort. And, and as wars evolve, this is kind of a, a new type of of total war. Now, this is in contra this is in contradistinction to say like you know, what you see with American imperialism, which is we have the military complex and we give them lots of money, but there's no real, like, if you blinked in the US, you would kind of forget about the fact that we're involved in six or seven different countries and we have soldiers all over the world and, and 900 military bases and whatever, because all that's kind of kept out of you, right? Now, that part of that is because our wars are fought far away, but part of it is because, you know, Part of the war machine in the U.S. is a racket. It always has been a racket. It makes lots of people very rich. Um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, warned about the potential for um, the potential for this uh, war machine to get uh, out of control. Right, the military-industrial complex, but the military-industrial complex doesn't count as total war because it exists in a separate kind of plane of existence, as it were, than kind of regular Americans um, like myself. And so, you know, we're seeing total war happen in, in, in Russia. Now, they're not feeling as much of the brunt of it because that war is happening, um, quote unquote, far away, which is to say it's happening primarily in Ukraine. Um, but Ukraine is really acting on the back foot, right? The war is very much present for them. Now, there hasn't been a draft necessarily, but there has been a huge mobilization of individuals. Um, and lots of people are volunteering. Um, I remember in the early days of the war that they were talking about, you know, not really having enough resources and supplies for all the people who wanted to sign up. And by the way, that would have been a, a, a good, good, um, timely, I guess, uh, opportunity to shift the, the, shift the country to a war economy to the extent that, that was possible. Now, again, we're not seeing total war happening um, we're not seeing kind of a complete move to total war in the Russia-Ukraine war, but I, I wanted to bring this up this week because I actually think that the escalation of sending tanks to Ukraine is perhaps going to get the ball rolling to create some sort of total war that goes on there. And by the way, guys, you know, I'm not just talking about this because I think it's an interesting topic and I want to educate people on it, but also I, I want to just put out an additional warning. Once you're in total war, it's really hard to transition back to kind of a peacetime footing, a peacetime economy. Now, obviously, it's extremely difficult if your country is the one that's physically being attacked. But at the same time, you know, there, there has to be some level of what victory is. And then after that, there has to be an active movement to demilitarize the economy. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do because lots of people are getting rich off the war. Uh, not just this war, but but all wars, and so I'm I'm hopeful that uh, when this war ends, and it will end, and I I hope and pray that it happens soon, and that there are as few casualties as possible, and that to the extent possible that the sovereign integrity of these countries is not too violated, and, and on and on it goes, right? Um, but I I wonder and I hope that the leadership will exist on the respective sides to demilitarize their economies. 
Because if they don't, I, I'm nervous that we would actually see kind of a reflare up in tensions in a couple of years. Now, mind you, right, this is the second major incursion that Russia has had in Ukraine in the past decade. So I almost wonder if that process of demilitarizing the economy is not going on in, in Russia. Now, they've taken so many casualties, they may not have a choice. But again, you know, I, I hope that there is enough wisdom and leadership there to demilitarize these economies once this terrible war is over, because once you move to a total war footing, war becomes the momentum, right? There's an inertia for war. And, you know, war is a terrible thing to the extent that we can prevent it, um, even through, you know, seemingly mundane things like shifting the economy, then I think that's an important step, an, an important step towards lasting peace. So I want to talk about Palestine um, and Israel. And I, I, there's really no good way for me to talk about this, but I'm very concerned that war, like all out war, is going to is going to come to this, is is going to come to, to Palestine. And you know. I, I see signs constantly of of tensions rising on on all sides, and, I, and I'm terrified that there's going to be a, a real war that goes on. And, and because Palestine doesn't really have an armed force, that this would become, you know, a terrible, bloody guerrilla war um, fraught with with terrorism and, and all sorts of, of of heinous acts. And so here's here's kind of my evidence for why I think this is coming. Right? I don't just want to, you know, I. I I don't just want to kind of put that negative energy into the world. Um, but we've seen the most extreme, uh, the most extreme right wing government in Israel that we've ever had. Likud is flirting with uh, genocidal language openly. Um, they are being led by people who don't think Palestinians are human beings and have said so publicly. Um, there, uh, there is um, active moves to concentrate power in the legislature. Uh, and to create more, um, and to have more explicit actions in terms of giving land to Israeli settlers. Now, speaking of Israeli settlers, in the past couple of years, there's been an incredible incursion of uh, Israeli settlers going to lands that are that are Palestine, um, claiming homes that they don't own. This was especially true in Sheikh Jarrah, um, but also. You know, you see in these communities where uh, Palestinians are have rocks being thrown at them. Um, there be there's there's murders by settlers who are being allowed to uh, who are being allowed to essentially kill these Palestinians and get away with it. Um, you don't hear a lot about prosecutions of Israeli settlers who who kill Palestinians. Um, they have increased access to weaponry, and you know when the Palestinians attempt to fight back to to defend themselves, the Israeli military, who is incredibly well armed uh, and well funded, and that's in huge part thanks to the United States, who who's kind of backing this this um, these these terrible acts. You know, they they come down super hard on the Palestinians, and and people are getting murdered every day, and you know those tensions are kind of normal, but we're seeing that there was an attack on. Um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is incredibly important to all Muslims, but specifically to the Palestinians, right, who are supposed to own that land. Um, and, um, you know, and so people are getting pushed to the edge and, and Palestinians have been, has been, have been fighting back in the ways that they know how, but they are being really, you know, outmatched by the incredible might and power of the IDF. And they're being ambushed by Israeli settlers who are, you know, be, who are violent towards them. Um, and so what happens? You, you, you take away any legitimate means that uh, the Palestinians have to, to defend themselves peacefully. And by the way, one of the ways that, that they have done this is that Israel has taken this away from the Palestinians is to, to, to essentially rig Israeli courts um, so that the, the deeds, the legal documents that Palestinians have for their homes are not valid in Israeli courts. And, and it has been difficult for Palestinians to prove that they own any land at all. So settlers are, are stealing their home and their land. And when you remove the ability to fight back peacefully, 
and you make it so that their representatives in the Knesset are not really functionally able to do anything, you enable and perhaps perpetuate terrorism because you think to yourself, well, I, you know, I tried doing it peacefully. I tried protesting. You know, we tried holding these massive funerals. We tried praying. And every time we protest, we get murdered. So we have to take matters into our own hands. And that's super scary. And an example of this having happened recently was there was, and I don't remember the name of the synagogue, and I apologize for that, but there was, there was a, a mass shooting in a, a synagogue in Jerusalem um, that was believed to be perpetuated by a Palestinian terrorist. And so we are on a terrible co collision path. And obviously, you know, Palestinians don't have their own army necessarily, not like the Israelis do. But you're going to start to see this lashing out. So whether you whether you call it a war or you, whether you call it an, an, um, an insurrection or a rebellion or whatever, there's going to be a violent confrontation between Palestinians and Israelis. And I'm really nervous that it's coming sooner rather than later. Now, look, in my heart of hearts, I want to believe that there will be a peaceable solution of some kind. But at the same time, I just, I see constantly what's happening and I see what the rhetoric is like and I see how the Palestinians have no real ability to gain peace after these things keep happening to them. And as I said earlier, you will eventually push them to, to terrorism, to assassinations, to, to anything to try and make their position a stronger one, right? And so I don't want anyone to get hurt and I don't want anyone to get killed, but we cannot continue to live in a world where the Israeli government, the Israeli settlers, and the Israeli military constantly um, make the lives of the Palestinians worse or take away their rights or murder them in cold blood and get away with all that and there be no recourse whatsoever because eventually you will spur a violent response. And, you know, th there are Palestinians in exile who sit in, in, in high up places in other um, governments in the region, Israel has never had a good relationship with its neighbors. And so who knows if, if there is a war and it becomes something truly terrible, will other nations step in? By the way, Egypt is a huge ally of the United States. They receive tons of money from the United States and they have one of the largest military thanks to our money. Does Egypt decide to get involved to protect the Palestinians? What about Jordan? What about Iraq? who knows right and i i don't you know, what about lebanon right hezbollah still has a huge grip on power there so i'm just super worried that we're going to see a war there and it's going to be worse than what we've seen before because the the politics and the rhetoric and all that has just changed you know we we're used to seeing kind of um what was the last major operation called? Um, something Edge. Uh, I can't think of what it was called. But there were, you know, we've had these incursions in Palestinian territory in the past, and they've been brutal and violent. Um, and there's been condemnation, but not by the United States, right? So we in the U.S., our government is is moving us towards potentially a situation that we are going to severely regret allowing to happen. Um, and for all those reasons, I'm just really terrified that there's going to be a real war there and it's going to get bad. Um, and so I hope it doesn't happen, but I'm just, I'm looking out at the world and I'm seeing what's happening and I can't help but be afraid that war is coming quickly. So in East Palestine, Ohio, this past week, there was a freight train derailment. Now, a freight train derailment is not necessarily anything new. However, this one was quite interesting um, because it was full of an incredibly harmful chemical. And it exploded when the train derailed. And not only did it explode, officials then came in to release, to, to perform a controlled release of the chemical. And so they told everyone to evacuate and of the area. And when you look at video of the controlled release, you can see that there's a fire cloud over a hundred feet into the air. And so now people are terrified to go back to their homes because 
why would you want to live near where there was a hundred foot fire plume when a chemical that you don't know anything about and it's, you know, it's ability or inability to harm you, you know, we've, we've now displaced all these individuals. And by the way, you know, we have to do a root cause analysis to see like, why did the train derail, right? So as reporting has gone on, you've started to see that, you know, there weren't a ton of people who were operating the freight train, right? And we know that this is common because when the rail strike was about to happen, you know, they were talking about, hey, we only have like two people per train. We're asking for four people per train, right? And they were, and the rail lines wanted to cut it down to one person per train. More interesting than that, you find out that this train was not regulated as hazardous, which makes you raise an eyebrow. Why would a, why would a train that's carrying something so dangerous that a mere derailment causes an explosion and when you release the rest of the chemical, it forms a fire cloud, a cloud literally made of fire at 100 feet tall. Like, that's something I introduced to my players in, a, in fantasy role-playing to make them afraid of something. Like, this should not be happening in real life, okay? So, you know, it's not being regulated as dangerous, not to mention that our rail infrastructure is incredibly old. Some of these rail lines haven't been updated in 100 years. We find out that the that the the brakes on some of these trains are relying on technology that's over a hundred years old. Now that might not necessarily be the problem, but it does appear that in all of these major freight derailments, you are using this exact same technology that is that essentially makes it super difficult for a train to stop in a way that preserves um, that preserves whatever is going uh, that is being carried by the train. So trains like this, there's actually a name for them. They're called bomb trains. And what effectively happens with them is, I mean, you know, best case scenario, nothing happens with them, right? But they're essentially bombs on the rails. So if they go off track or if something happens to them or if they get uh, attacked or overheat or they're going through a dangerous area or whatever, like there's a literal explosive on the tracks. And, and it's not just chemicals, right? It's, it's, it's oil, it's natural gas, all these things. So look, we have dangerous things in the world and they need to be transported places. Okay, we all get that. But we have to have the infrastructure and the regulation and the technology available to actually make it safer for people because Tons of people live around or near rail lines. I mean, I, I live near one. Um, I lived near one when I was a kid. Uh, rail, it, although it doesn't receive the investment that it deserves, it's still a really important part of the economy. And when we learned about the rail strike, you know, we learned that they're moving $2 billion of, of freight a day. That is an incredible amount of the U.S. economy that still sits on the rails. And if we're relying on trains so much, Shouldn't they be safe, right? Shouldn't we, because we can't move the rail tracks oftentimes and we can't move the communities who have grown up next to them, wouldn't it be better if we just built better trains or repaired the rail lines? But that would cost money. And unfortunately, the rail lines are not nationalized. We as a people of this country don't own them. And so we're relying on private corporations who have lobbyists and who buy politicians to, you know, to regulate themselves, to implement the new technologies, to buy better trains, to, you know, pay for um, the investments that are necessary. And they're just not going to do it, guys. A corporation has literally only one job, make more money, right? Make more money than you did last quarter and the quarter before that and the quarter before that. And if you can't do that as a CEO, guess what? You're getting sacked. Sorry. So all the incentives are in the worst places possible. And so what happens? Well, there are only two ways to make more money in a capitalist system. Increase price of services or decrease costs, right? You, gotta bring in, you either bring in more revenue or you cut the amount of, of money leaving the organization. And so what ends up happening? They cut corners, hopefully not literally, um, but you know, they, you know they, they go out and they don't do the best that they can or they skimp in places where they think no one will notice. And then this kind of stuff happens. 
we have destroyed an entire town with this event. I don't know if anyone will ever come back to East Palestine, Ohio. That town may be effectively dead from now until forever, or as long as it takes for the government to say that you know, there's no more traces of this chemical in the air and in the ground and wherever else. But we need to do preventative care for our railways. We cannot wait for these terrible tragedies um, to happen. And again, I, I don't know how many people have been, um, I don't know how many people who have been killed um, or harmed from the derailment, but we cannot wait for these terrible accidents to occur to realize, oh wait, maybe we should have done something about our railway, railway infrastructure. And by the way, last thing I wanna say here is the workers have been warning us not the American people, but the regulators and the train companies about this for a long time. Guys, the workers are the closest people to the things that are going on with their industry. If they tell you something's wrong, believe them, right? It's not difficult. Management, I get it. They don't want to, they don't want to do anything that would cut into their precious, precious profits, but Listen to your workers, protect your workers, okay? And, and the government, you guys need to come in and do something here too. It, we should not be relying on private corporations to do literally any of this. We should have strong regulation. Those regulations should be enforced with heavy fines or jail time for executives. And we should start to move to a posture where transporting things over the rails, and we do so much of it, is safe for hazardous chemicals and for mundane items. Look, the truth is, we're going to have to transport dangerous things. I don't like it. I wish we didn't have to. But most of the time, stuff's got to move. And it's going to move on the rails. They should at least be safe for the workers, for the community, everyone. All right. So for our last story today, I want to talk about a, uh, a, a, a bit of a controversial opinion I have. Um, but, you know, first I want to introduce our, our subject. Uh, I want to talk about George Anthony Katara's, Katara Vaj Zabrowski Devolder Santos. I think I got all the names. George Anthony Katara Vaj Zabrowski Devolder Santos. There we go. So, yes. Is he the worst liar potentially in politics? Yeah, probably. But here's, here's my unpopular take. You ready? I don't care. So here, here's the reason, okay, guys. All, all politicians lie, okay? They say they're going to do things. They don't do them. They say they're going to fight for things. They don't fight for them. The question becomes, and they say, here's where I think it actually gets really interesting, okay? The question actually is less, do we want liars to be in government? It's more the question of how many lies or what caliber of lies are we comfortable with? as a populist, right? Are we comfortable with someone saying they're gonna fight for something that they never fight for? Are we confident, are we comfortable with someone saying they achieve something that they never achieved? How many achievements puts us over that limit where we're just no longer comfortable? This is a super interesting experiment. I almost wonder, you know, it's like, it's super fascinating to me, right? Because like, for whatever reason, Trump isn't, Trump isn't the limit, right? Like tr Trump is an acceptable amount of lies. Joe Biden is an acceptable amount of lies. But Santos is not an acceptable amount of lies. Okay, well, he lied about his past. And he lied about all of these other things. And again, it's like, sure, it's bad. But here, here's the thing, guys. Regardless of who someone says they are in Congress or, or when they're running for Congress or whatever, whatever they say they're going to fight for, yada, yada, yada. The thing that matters is actually what they do when they're in. And so if you get to a situation where in two years, because right, uh, a, con a congressperson's term is only, um, they have not done any of the things they said they're gonna do, then vote them out, right? Because you have an opportunity every two years to say, hey, you delivered or no, you didn't deliver or, or whatever it's gonna be. And so I think honestly, the people of New York should give George Santos a chance. Not that I think he's going to do anything good with that chance, but they elected him, and it's going to be really hard to get him out of there. 
especially because he sucked up to Kevin McCarthy and he's, you know, kind of virtue signaling about some of the things that Republicans tend to love. So now, voted for whom we're like, eh, I'm not really sure about this whole George Santos guy, or he's a Brophy guy, or whatever you want to call him. We just kind of need to wait it out and see what happens. Okay. And by the way, let this be a lesson. One, to the New York Times, do your research ahead of time. Put out your exposés ahead of time. It is no use. It is no good to us to put out an exposé once the candidate's already elected and going to get seated. Come on. <laughs> Two, to the people, right? We need, as a society, to pay more attention, better attention to who our elected officials are, to who they say they are, to who they actually are, to how they vote. Three, other elected officials have to hold each other accountable. If you don't like the fact, and, and there was this whole big uh, this stink between Mitt Romney and, and George Santos at the State of the Union, okay, well, Mitt Romney has some sway with Republicans in the House. Get a vote on kicking him out of Congress or get some votes to kick him off as committee assignments. There is so much that we can learn from the George Santos saga that I actually, I'm not super mad at it. Okay, now I get it. If you're in his district and you thought you were getting one thing and you're not getting it, I hear you. I, but at the same time, we need to remember that no politicians are honest and that we have to be much more articulate as a population about what threshold of goodness and honesty that we're willing to tolerate. Because we've already said that we are willing to put virulent, terrible liars in the halls of power. That's nothing new. And if we're really so outraged about that and we really want to change that really badly, then the thing that we have to do is we have to do our homework on our candidates. We have to take more time when we vote for people. Now, look, I get it, right? People are working multiple jobs. It's very difficult to participate, yada, yada, yada. I, I'm not discounting any of that, guys, all right? I'm, I'm well aware. But the point is, it's no good getting mad after the fact that he's a total fraud because we elect total frauds all the time. And sometimes we don't get a choice, but sometimes we do. And with George Santos, there was a choice and we made it. And now I gotta stick with that for two years. So sorry, New York, that you have a, a terrible lying representative, but you only have to deal with them for two years, and then you can vote them out. So my advice, vote them out. Time will come soon enough. All right, so now we are going to punch down our dough, and that's so satisfying, isn't it? After we punch it down, we are going to get our dough back into a relative ball and put it on an extremely lightly floured countertop. After that, we're going to just get it back into a ball shape. This is going to allow us to divide the dough as easily as possible. Now, you're supposed to di divide it between two, uh, four and eight pieces. I chose six. And if you want to be more exact, I was just kind of doing it by eye. As you see, I had to remeasure one of them. Um, I would use a scale. But ultimately, the procedure is going to be the same. Divide the dough into four to eight pieces. And then once you've done that, you're going to flatten them into little rectangles about six inches by four inches. Uh, I would measure that if I were you. And then roll them up like you're rolling up a cinnamon roll. Now, once you finish rolling them, you want to pinch the edges at the bottom to make sure that the seam that you've just created doesn't show. Then put them seam side down on your baking tray. Repeat these with all of the rolls that you've created and once you're done there you're going to want to get to prepare them to rise because they're going to have to rise again if you want to score them and you have a lame now is the time to do that just run your lame quickly across the top and that'll give you your nice little score you only want to score about a quarter of an inch down so that you don't create too much of a hole after this we're going to lightly oil some plastic wrap and i'm using a paintbrush for this but you don't have to um, you're welcome to just kind of spray it if you have pam spray but we are going to be getting our plastic wrap ready for rising this will keep our dough moist and you're just going to repeat the exact same thing uh, with another piece of plastic on the second set of dough after this you're going to let that rise for 30 45 minutes and then you're going to set your oven for 
375 degrees Fahrenheit and set it to cook for 16 to 24 minutes. Thank you so much for watching this video from Let Me Eat Bread. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Twitch and on Facebook where announcements about our page are kept. We make videos every week and you can find all of our videos at youtube.com at sign Let Them Eat Bread. Thanks again and see you next time.